I do know you have other midterms, right? Because whenever I think it's a good time for a midterm, it's everybody is else is thinking the same it's thing. Never a good time. No, the first one was same time. Right now, it's just, my advanced will be next one. So it never ends, right? But it's all around the same time, right? Um, all right, so I'm going to prove the theorem, the Fermat's little, uh, little theorem. And make sure this is the opportunity right in here to understand every detail because I ask you fill in the blank in terms of do you understand what this line is? Explain it back to me. So that's how the fill in the blank works. So it's not a regurgitation of the proof. It's a do you understand what I did here, what I did here, what I did here. So I'll give you some examples as I go through. So let me start first with the intuition behind the proof with a number example. So I took P equals 7. Um, and if you had abstract algebra and you understood it, this will make sense. So every integer is congruent. Every single integer is congruent to either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 because these are the remainders when you divide by 7. So it's the equivalence classes that I spent some time talking about that when you divide any integer by 7, you can pack it into one of these boxes and 0 through 6 represents what the label is on the outside of each one of the boxes. So every integer is going to be congruent to one of these, these seven numbers. I'm going to leave at 0 and look at, for example, a equals 12. If I take those purple numbers except for 0 and I multiply through by 12, I get this second list. Now what happens if I take that second list and mod by 7? That's right. You get the same for as list as a first set of numbers, except they're rearranged. It's what we call a permutation. So again, if you've had modern algebra or you're taking modern algebra right now, you're talking about permutations. This is a permutation of the original um, seven, six numbers that I have in purple without the zero. Why did I leave zero out? Well, um, I'm not interested in things where A is divisible by P, right? That's a condition of the Fermat's little theorem that P should not divide A. The zero box are those elements where P does divide A. So that's why I'm allowed to leave zero out in this little number example, and that's why I'm going to be able to leave zero out in the proof. So I just wanted you to see this with numbers before I start the proof, so you can see what I'm talking about um, with an actual real example. I just picked a number. I'm going to prove Fermat's little theorem. I'll remind you what Fermat's little theorem is, but there's a P and there's an A in Fermat's little theorem. And the condition of Fermat's little theorem is that P should not divide A. Okay? So I picked an A randomly that, does, that P doesn't divide to illustrate this property that when I take A and multiply it through this list, I just get a rearrangement of those purple numbers. Right? So keep that in mind when I'm proving the theorem because having that number example in your mind is going to make it gel much better. Okay, so let me go back to the statement of Fermat's little theorem because it's been a day, right? This is Fermat's little theorem. If P is a prime number and P does not divide A, then A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. That's a statement of Fermat's little theorem. We saw Fermat's big theorem the other day too, right? The book that was passed around. <laughs> I've been, uh, for a while back, I was asking a grad, grad students, anybody want to do a reading course with me on this and just read the book through? Somehow I had no takers. No takers. <laughs> I just don't understand it. <laughs> so just to remind you, last time I showed you this theorem and I showed you an application because it looks like Nothing. And then I showed you how it was used to find a remainder from, so I get, and I assigned you some of those remainder problems. And by the way, remainder problems are on the test, so simple, similar to this. So one of your computational problems is a remainder problem. I drew one out here. Okay. So here's the proof. Um, I had mentioned to someone in the class that I think, well, even if I don't have the steps, I am able to go back and change my proof into steps and highlight each step so that it's understandable. So that's the way I think. If you really want to understand a proof of something, 
try to lay labels on each piece so that you can explain what's going on. So the first step in this proof is that uh, I'm, I know that P is prime, that's my given, and um, I'm going to list out all the congruence classes of mod P, just like I did with the 7. So, but now I have an abstract P. I don't have a specific number 7. So I'm going to list out all those congruence classes from 0 to P minus 1. All integers, I make the observation that all integers, uh, mod p, belong to one of those classes, like I did with the 7. That's why it's good to have a number example in your mind. When you start seeing the abstract letters, you can think of something like it with a number in it. So example of the fill in the blank, this is just an example. Explain why all the integers will be congruent to 0, 1, dot, 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 p minus 1. Why don't you have a p, for example? Why don't I have to li list a p? That's right. Zero is already t p is already in the congruence class of 0. That's why p doesn't have to be listed. Make sense how I'm going to ask it? So under each... You can think of each line uh, that I write in the proof. You should be able to make up your own fill in the blank. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Can you give me an example of this? And so forth. Since P doesn't divide A, we will ignore 0 because 0 represents multiples of P, uh, multiples of P and, it, and since P doesn't divide A, A can't be a multiple of P. So I'm, I'm not going to have to worry about the 0 congruence class. Um, the next step is to do the same thing I did with that number 7 list. I'm going to take that original list that was in teal and then multiply that list through by A. So I get this list. So in your head, you should have the little example I had to do it with the 1 through 7. Do you have it in your head? Song, you have it in your head? Oh, yeah. Good. I was afraid something else was in your head. <laughs> is there something else in your head? Something else is in his head. <laughs> See, I knew it. I'm telepathic. <laughs> That's what I tell my kids. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> like the 1 through 7, my goal is to show that this list is a rearrangement of that 1 through P minus 1. With the numbers, I can see it. Here's the list, and here's the rearrangement. I can see it. But somehow, I have to now abstractly show that this new list is going to just be a rearrangement of the other list. Well, what would I have to do to show that? The first thing I'd have to show is that none of these in the list ended up being 0. So 0 shouldn't be there, right? So that's the first goal. The second goal is that none of them equaled each other. Because I have here exactly um, p minus 2 elements. Like I had 6 before, I have exactly p minus 2. The only way I could go wrong is if one of them was 0, that means I, I don't have the original list rearranged, or if two of these were equal to each other. If two of them are equal to each other, then the list has gotten smaller. So if I have exactly 6 things, right, if I have exactly p minus 2 things, then I'm going, or p minus 1 things, then I'm going to have, they're all distinct, and they have to be a rearrangement then. Does that make sense? So one more time. With the number seven, I ended up with six things, right? And each of those six things were different. I'm done then, because if those six things are different and zero wasn't one of those six things, then they have to be that original list moved around, right? Same thing here. I have P minus one things. If zero's not in there, then I haven't added something new in there. And if none of them are equal to each other, then they're distinct p minus 1 things. Then it's the first list rearranged. I don't know what that rearrangement is, but I'm done. I've shown that the first thing is just a, this new list is a rearrangement of the first. Okay. Um, so that's the first step. I'm going to show that 0 didn't suddenly accidentally appear in the list. Just like the 1 through 7, 0 didn't appear in the list, right, when I multiply by 12. So let's make sure 0 doesn't appear in the list. So assume, on the contrary, that one member of the list is actually congruent to 0 mod p. Let's call it k times a, because all those things on the list were a multiple of a, right? 
So I can just say arbitrarily it's k times a. So I'm assuming that p divides k times a, or it ended up being 0. That means p has to divide k times a by definition of congruence. There's a theorem in your book. You should know this theorem, because you try to apply this theorem. If p is prime, and p divides two numbers, then p has to divide this or this. It's a lemma in your book. It should be like a standout huge theorem. So if p divides the multiple of two things, then p's got to divide one, or p's got to divide the other. That's the only two possibilities. Do you remember that theorem? This is how um, we learn from applying things. That you, just, you learn from applying things. You don't learn from adhering it. Um, k smaller than p, right? Because I'm listing out all the multiples of p minus 1. So k is going to be smaller than p. Well, then p can't divide k because k is too small. That means, by that theorem, that p has to divide a. But that's a problem, because in my hypothesis, p is not supposed to divide a. Right? So therefore, none of the list is congruent to 0 mod p, so 0 didn't appear in the list. So first thing is done, that 0 didn't suddenly make an appearance there. Some people are taking notes, so I want to let them catch up. It'll also make me calm down, so it has a benefit. <laughs> Just imagine, you're seeing me with three different classes, long days, toughest class in a grad program. If you saw me at 8 in the morning <laughs> with two courses, I would be even more excited and more enthusiastic. <laughs> no takers on that one either. We could do that for Ma's big theorem book at 8 in the morning. I'm <laughs> OK, if you go back to the list, um, you're looking at multiples of p minus 1, right? So you're taking the a, so you can't, right? All of those things are going to be smaller than p minus, because it's a remainder, right? There's no way that k can be bigger, because you're modding out. Uh, reducing. We call it reducing in class. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Good? So zero's not in there. Now I have to show none of them ended up equaling each other. So if I assume that none of them, if I sh I'm able to show this, I'm done. Because it means that I have exactly six things, or p minus one things. If they're all distinct, and they're all smaller, then they're just a rearrangement of the original list. So two, pick two random items from the list. One's going to be r times a, and one's going to be s times a. Right? They're all multiples of a. I know that R is smaller than P, and I know that S is smaller than P in answer to your question, right? There's no way that those multiples will get higher than P. Because I took the original list and multiplied by A, right? The original list was 1 to P minus 1, right? So these guys, this R is an element from 1 to P minus 1, and this S is an element from 1 to P minus 1. What we've got to show is that can for these not to be congruent to each other, I've got to show this property. Or vice versa, I've got to show that P can't divide these, this thing right here by definition of congruence. Again, I'm applying that lemma. It's on page 15, by the way, if you want to look it up. Um, P divides this product if and only if P divides R minus S because P doesn't divide A by hypothesis already. So all I have to show is P can't divide R minus S, and I'm done. Well, the problem is R could be bigger than S. I could have actually got around that by saying one of them's got to be smaller and, and done the math the right way, but you can still get around it. And here's how you get around it. I'll wait till they finish taking notes. <laughs> Right. 
take my original two inequalities, and I'm going to take that second one and multiply through by minus 1, and then set them up one in the, over the other, and just add straight down. So R minus S is sandwiched between minus P and P. So R minus S in magnitude is smaller than P. So how could P divide it? Right? If you take a, a number in magnitude that's smaller than what you're dividing it by, you'll get a fraction. So it, it won't work. So P can't divide R minus S. I could have used some words here. Right, Daniel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Do you understand this? This is just um, algebra yeah. from ninth grade. So this makes sense, right? So I get this sandwich here, right? So this means that if I divide it through by P, I get negative 1 is less than R minus S divided by P is less than 1, right? That means that that number in the center is a fraction, yeah. right? So it can't divide it. It's impossible. It's a, it's a decimal number it's, that isn't zeros, right? It's not an integer. So therefore, P cannot divide R minus S. So every one of these numbers in that list is distinct. So I have P minus 1 things in that list, and I add P minus 1 things in the original list. They've got to be the same list, but rearranged. Thumbs up. We need to illuminate. So I'm going to multiply these two lists out. If they're the same numbers but rearranged, like 1 times 2 times 3 and 3 times 2 times 1, that's going to be the same product, right? It doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter because multiplication is commutative. So if I multiply this side, it's the same thing as multiplying that side. They're one and the same number. So it's like you have 15 is congruent to 15 going to be the same number on both sides. Remember this from Calc 2? What do I have here in this list? I have 1 times 2 times 3 times dot, 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 all the way to p minus 1. And I also have a times a times a all the way to p minus 1. If I gather in together all the a's, that's a raised to the p minus 1 power. And if I take the 1, 2, 3, all the way to p minus 1, the definition of that is p minus 1 factorial. And on this side, I, I, I just have p minus 1 factorial. And I think you can see the writings on the wall, because I'm going to splash out that p minus 1 from both sides, the factorial from both sides. But before I do that, when am I allowed to cancel? Earlier in this earlier in the congruence section, we did a, a problem on a quiz that you had to cancel from both sides, but you had to first check something. A, C, A, C. Yeah, that's right. Yes, right. The mod and the A have to be relatively prime, or the C, however you want to call it, have to be relatively prime in order for you to cancel. And they are. Because all those numbers, P is the prime, and there's nothing everything's smaller than that prime, so I mean there's no way that you could get something underneath it dividing it. So the, they're relatively prime, so I can cancel, and so I get, in fact, the end of Fermat's little theorem. It's a beautiful little proof. If you don't see the beauty in this, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I, it's hard to describe it to someone who like if I went and showed this to my pre-calc students and I said this is beautiful, they might not understand it. Uh, they might think I, well they already know that I'm nuts, but they might not appreciate it. But hopefully you're at a level now that you can look at this and say this is beautiful in the same way that a painting is beautiful. It's beautiful. And I see little smiles on your face, either you're humoring me or you think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful, right? I don't know. <laughs> humoring, okay. I'll take it. So I gave you guys um, this homework last time. I showed you this last time. 
So that, that's it. That's for Mazda Sam. So I think you have a pretty good idea of what's going to be on the exam. I don't, I would be very, very, very surprised if you didn't do well. <laughs> Questions? <laughs>